in D.C., but also there'll be kind of a green uh, logo there. And if you click on that, you'll get uh, an audio tape that will give you a centering activity and a relaxation activity and make clear that being centered and present at the moment is not about being relaxed. If you're clear, if you're present in the moment, with a moment that's safe, you'll be relaxed. But if there's a sense of danger, you won't. It's still better to be in the moment you're actually in than traveling off somewhere else. So the first thing to do is to recognize that stupid voice. Well, what is your stupid voice? It's the voice that recommends to you to do things that you have already decided not to do. It's not that hard to figure out. Just ask yourself. If I pay attention to this, if I get serious about what I'm hearing, or you, and you might even add urges, the thing about urges is, urges usually come with words like, oh yeah, you need to do this. If they came with words like, oh no, that's stupid, don't do that, then the urges wouldn't be such a problem. But uh, they usually come with some kind of blah, 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 and the first thing to do is to recognize, oh, if I do that, I'm going to end up doing things that are not the ones I want to be doing. And then refuse. Now, you don't have to refuse by arguing or fighting or uh, uh, dismembering or whatever it is your stupid voice. You can just say, no, thank you. I ain't going to do that. The thing is, as a famous psychologist named Bogdan Winsley, he used to say, that goals that dead people are good at are not the best goals for living people. And when it comes to don't do, dead people are really good at don't do. So we're not only going to refuse, we're going to redirect toward your hierarchy of that. What are the things in life that for you make fulfillment? Stuff that you actually do give a crap about. Now, one thing that can be really tough in people who spend a lot of time in addictive behavior is they've lost contact with anything they actually do give a crap about. So, one of the first things is getting back in contact. Yeah, I actually do care about that. And I could act in this moment to serve <coughs> those things I actually do care about. And that's what the hierarchy of values is. Just while we're talking about values, in a way, uh, values are usually expressed in words, but the word isn't the value. Closeness to people is blah, blah, blah. If you do closeness to people, if you get next to them, if you make psychological contact with them, that's what the value is. The point of value talk is to lead you in that direction. And that's the third thing. Redirect yourself with your value talk to moving your hands and arms and feet and mouth in the service of the things you really want to make important about. Because just living a long time in fairly good condition is onions and carrots can do that, but we've got more opportunities. So I have let myself five minutes for questions. Are there any? Yes, ma'am. In terms of cognitive dissonance, can you give us some tips on how to redirect? Well, uh, this I think is one of the great values of this tool because the thing that is tough often for people at the beginning and even later on in uh, working with smart recovery if they want to do disputing irrational beliefs, they've got to come up with what is an irrational belief, what is a dispute, et cetera, et cetera. So the great thing about this arm is the first thing you have to do is just recognize what's going to happen if I go along with that. If I take seriously this thought or this image, or for that matter, this earth, but usually again, or just come with thoughts. If I take it seriously, what am I going to be doing? Well, now, I don't have to get into some kind of argument about yes or no or back or forth. I can just refuse to go along with that and instead redirect myself to my hierarchy of values. Uh, 
pretty specific point of proof they got. Uh, a quick story about cognitive distance. So this uh, psychiatrist heard about cognitive distance and had a patient who thought that they were dead. So they said, I'm going to figure this out. How they brought the patient in. So the patient is, uh, are dead people, do they bleed? And the guy thought about the way. He said, no, dead people don't bleed. And so he'd gone down to the ER, picked up a curette, and said, can I see your finger a minute? And he poked the guy, pushed the finger, and blood came out. And the physician said, now, what do you think about that? The guy looked at his finger and said, my goodness, how about that? Dead people do bleed. <laughs> so you can't ever tell which way the cognitive dissonance is going to be resolved. But if you focus on this approach, then you're not going to have that. Because all that fighting back and forth, well, does fighting back and forth help me be directed toward my hierarchy of values? Or is that the way um, towards uh, behaving again addictively, it was so much trouble to figure out what to do, I thought I'd just shoot up anyway. So, who's next? Does Simon make David tools? Yes. Yeah. And I often say in meetings that you can just say things, you know, for no um, Do you have a new worksheet for this way of setting it, recognize you to redirect, and then also, like, do the original worksheet is a lot of, like, uh, more aggressive refusal that I think may or may not be helpful. So. New worksheet. Uh, no, I, uh, I do not have a worksheet. Thank you very much. I get busy. <laughs> we could actually be on time. We could actually be on time. Oh, one. So, concepts of recognize, refuse, and redirect are relatively speaking key word of concrete terms that uh, more often than not can be uh, uh, applicable in normal ways. But the question here is, how does one go about formulating uh, uh, one's hierarchy of values? Because to be honest, it's a relatively abstract concept. So can we just share a few comments on that? The only thing that makes values, in my opinion, abstract, is all the talk about them. Now, if you've ever hugged a kid that was your kid, you know if you gave a crap about that or not. If you ever helped somebody out, and they appreciated it, and whether they appreciated it or not, you know if you gave a crap about that. If you ever made a promise, and you kept that promise, you know if you gave a crap about that. Now I'll give you, I'll give you. If you've been engaged in addictive behavior long enough, you may have lost contact with that, which is why the, 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 one of the early things is what do you actually give a damn about? Not what does your brain know? I, 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 I just don't care about freedom. I, 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 I don't care about that. What I'm interested in is, if, if you put ice cream on your tongue, do you have any trouble telling? Like, oh yeah, ice cream, that's good, man. Anybody got any trouble with that kind of experience? I don't think so. Now, what's the talk about? You know, it goes on and on and books and blah, blah, blah. All we're really interested in, do you have words that direct you towards actions that are in that direction? That's all we have to think about values as being. If the words are directed in a different way, well, probably that's your stupid voice. If they're directing you towards your hierarchy of values, then those are the things that you actually give a damn about. And give a damn about is right in here, or right in here, it ain't a people. Okay. Oh, Joe. No. Oh. no. Ah, Joe, you can't talk. <laughs> <laughs>
inspirational and challenging ideas presented. We still have a really long way to go. I just want to leave you with one little, one anecdote that's really been bothering me for the last week or so. Um, a couple weeks ago, I got an email from a colleague on the, who's on the UK board and recently on the Smart International Board. He needed a reference um, to get a visa to come to this conference. He lives in England. And um, so to travel here, so I'm like, sure, I'll do that, no problem. Um, he's a great guy, and he works in the addiction field, is a father, has a young child, known him for a few years, so I wrote a reference letter for him, much as you would somebody referring to without a job, and said, you know, what a great job he's done on the UK board, and how he was recently nominated to the International Board, that sort of thing. Didn't really think much of it. I'm sure, he got a couple of references too from people with smart. And turns out his uh, visa request was denied. Why? Because he has a history of addiction, even though he's been clean and sober for, I don't know, at least five years, maybe seven years. Seven years. And, um, uh, you know, has worked in the field, helping others, has moved up in his career, has a very high position in our organization on two different boards. And he can't attend. He can't attend the international meeting, which is going to take place this afternoon and tomorrow. Fortunately, he's going to be able to phone in. Uh, people at all high levels of the organization contacted various government officials, people who know him as a congressman, to try to, to try to change this. But thanks to Homeland Security, He's not here, so we still have a really long way to go. Um, you know, it's great, a lot of the progress that we've made, but it is so infuriating when when this when we still come across this kind of thing. So I just want to leave you with that little anecdote to hopefully put some fire in our bellies to keep going out there and keep working hard, um, not just for SMART, but for everyone out there who is suffering with addiction or with the ongoing stigma of addiction. I mean, yeah. So thanks very much. Please remember to turn in your CEU forms and your evaluation forms and have a great rest of your afternoon.